This is the Sales Bevel Podcast, episode 363, Sales Management That Works, an interview with Frank Suspedes. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And now your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, sales babblers. This is Pat Helmers. And I don't know about you, but I think there's a ton of problems with sales management, which is why I decided to have sales expert and Harvard Business School professor Frank Suspedis visit us here on the podcast to babble about the challenges and solutions that both sales managers and sales professionals face. We talk about hiring, compensation, process, and most importantly, the necessity for sellers to think and act like owners and for the C-suite executives to think like salespeople. Frank's got a new book out titled Sales Management That Works. It just came out in February, and believe it or not, in this episode, we solve all the world's problems. You don't want to miss it. And so, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Frank. Are you ready to babble? I am ready to babble and banter. And Pat, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you and with your listeners. Well, actually, I'm quite excited to have you on the podcast, Frank, because you and I have a common interest in fixing bad sales management. And uh, you've just written a book, a book that's coming out in February here called Sales Management That Works. So my first question is, how is sales management not working, Frank? Well, I mean, there are a couple of things. There's a a lot of circumstantial evidence about uh, problems with sales. Uh, You're probably familiar with this, Pat. Um, You know, fewer salespeople uh, making quota, um, slowdown in productivity in the U.S. and a lot of other economies, et cetera. And the reasons for that, I think, are, among others, uh, outlined in my book. Uh, Most important thing about selling is buying, and buying is changing. It's changing in part because of uh, information technologies, in part because we're in a data information-rich world. But I think the implications of what those new technologies actually mean for selling Uh, are often misunderstood or simply misinterpreted. I I like how you started there because you said that there's been a lack of of focus on buying. But it's interesting, you wrote a book called Sales Management That Works versus Buying Management That Works. Yeah, but the, uh, the book begins by outlining what is changing in buying. And, you know, to make a longer story short... The basic uh, uh, issue is this. For about 60 plus years, um, most um, buying has been uh, framed by sales organizations around the world. I'm now going to get academic uh, with you and your audience for a moment, Pat, but it's been framed in terms of what academics call a hierarchy of effects model. And what they're getting at that, uh, uh, getting at with that is that It assumes that buying is a linear sequential process where your job in sales is to move the prospect from awareness to interest to desire to action, AIDA, AIDA, uh, as it's called. And that AIDA paradigm has been the, um, the basis, very often the unconscious basis, for the way companies organize sales, the way they deploy salespeople, it's built in uh, to virtually all CRM systems around the world. And that's not the case. Um, uh, Buyers now don't go through a sequential funnel. Uh, They are online, offline, at multiple times during their buying journey. And that makes a big difference in what it is you've got to do in order to sell effectively. This is really, really true. Everybody's got this big, huge list of things that they're working on. Buying your stuff is just one thing that's on their list. Of course, to the seller, it's of the highest priority. <laughs> but, but it certainly isn't of the buyer, is it? Yep. 
No, I think that's right. But I also think that, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, difference in buying processes makes a big difference and, and is understood. Let me give you an example. And it's an example I think we can all relate to. Uh, the example is buying a car, right? Bu buying an automobile. Um, about nine, it's almost like your body temperature, about 98% of cars, uh, at least before the pandemic, were bought uh, in dealerships. And the latest data I've seen is that still, even during uh, a plague year, more than 90% of cars have been bought in dealerships. On the other hand, and J.D. Power has very good data about this, the average U.S. auto buyer now spends almost 13 hours researching the purchase. Uh, you, you have probably done this. You know, you go to sites like Edmunds.com, Autotrader.com. They can tell you what it is, uh, the wholesale price uh, for the automobile, what, what the wholesale price is for different options, etc., and the average U.S. auto buyer only spends a total of about three and a half hours in the dealerships themselves. But still, 90 plus percent of cars are bought in the dealerships. Now, does this mean that the Internet is uh, getting rid or disintermediating, as they say, uh, car salespeople? No, that's not the case. But it's still a big deal, right? Because now the buyer walks into the dealer already armed with product information, comparative price information, et cetera. And I think anyone who's bought a car in the United States over the last 10 to 20 years, you know, has, has found how in the last decade, it's become a much more uh, pleasurable and efficient process, not because dealers went to Bible school, but because of what it is that technology and search information has done to buying. So how does that affect then the sales professional? Because that's who's listening to this podcast. Yeah. Well, I think, um, it, yeah. Yeah, go on. I, well, I think it affects sales in at least um, four areas that I uh, talk about uh, in the book that you kindly mentioned. One is, and this is always where I think you got to begin in sales, people. It affects hiring criteria. It affects training. Uh, it affects um, the way uh, and what you look at when you do performance evaluations. It also affects process, sales models. Many sales models uh, are basically based on obsolete assumptions about buying. It affects um, partners. Uh, in an omni-channel buying world, you need a multi-channel go-to-market. I can't tell you, uh, you know, look, I do a lot of work with companies. I've probably been in as many strategy meetings as anybody, certainly as many as anybody at Harvard Business School. And, you know, I can't tell you how many discussions I've sat through that I consider sterile academic discussions about, you know, should we be online or should we be brick and mortar? Should we be online or should we have a sales force. And at this point in the 21st century, the answer is yes, you've got to do both because of buyers. And then the fourth thing I think is pricing. Uh, it's an information rich world. Uh, ironically, I think the opportunities for value pricing and price testing have increased, but many, many companies and sales forces um, display a lot of inertia in that crucial area of business. Yeah, I I saw this on here. You had these 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 you had five P's actually in your book that I saw. People, process, partners, pricing, and you had another one. Productivity. Uh, productivity that's right. Yep. Um, you know my point about productivity. You know the and, and the pandemic actually has illustrated this. I mean, why why has this pandemic been such an economic catastrophe? Well, the United States, like most other advanced economies, is now primarily a services-dominated economy, right? I think it's now about 75% of our GDP comes from service businesses, not, um, uh, not, not product or manufacturing businesses. And obviously, that's where the pandemic 
uh, makes itself felt um, uh, most horribly. Uh, at the same time, we have had for 20 years in America a significant slowdown in economic productivity and therefore growth. Uh, and in a services economy, sales productivity is not just something, if you're a CEO, that you do in order to increase shareholder value, although you know I think you do it for that reason among others and you don't need to apologize for that, but it's also a social issue. Uh, it affects not just the lives of millions of people, but it affects economic growth directly and economic growth, and we've seen this play out in our politics in the last decade, economic growth affects core democratic processes. So um, that's what I mean by productivity. I really agree with you that sales has not moved forward. In fact, Professor, explain this to me, sir. You know, why is it I can't get a degree in selling, but I get a degree in marketing? And I think a lot of companies look at selling like it's some kind of mechanical marketing thing when it's really not because value and all that kind of stuff comes from actual sales, not from, not from studies, you know, and not from social media tweets. So, so it, it seems to me like companies just are not investing in this, not investing in people. I, I saw in your book that you said that's, that, that spending has gone up 20% on, on sales training. But it was like that nowhere. I think that's just really small numbers. <laughs> so twenty well, percent of a small number is just another small number. Um, well, no. Um, I let me. I don't want to sound like you know. You know the famous uh, comment. Who was it? President Harry Truman at one point said, "You know, give me a one-handed economist." They're always saying on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, um, yes. But but that is going to be my response. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you are right. Uh, about the um, the um, what I'll call the status of uh, sales, but it's very important to understand why that's the case and why, in many ways, it's gotten worse. Um, uh, there's this is, I think, one of the uh, better kept secrets uh, uh, in business, uh, and it, there was a colleague of mine. She did a terrific study of this, but if you look at the so-called C-suite in the uh, global 1000, you know, the jargon, CEO, yep. CFO, CMO, yep, yep, yep. et cetera. Yep. The number of people reporting to uh, the CEO on average in these firms has doubled in the last 25 years, twice as much. But if you ask yourself, who are these people? Where did they come from? What did they do before they became senior executives? The reality is that very few of them are actually general managers in the sense in which we usually use that term, meaning somebody who um, ran a line of business or had P&L responsibility. And if you look at the Hydric and Struggles reports about who gets to the top, uh, the reality is that fewer people than ever before spent any significant time in sales before they became senior executives. Now, why is this happening? It's not happening because, you know, companies wake up in the morning and say, oh boy, let's be bureaucratic. Uh, it's happening again because of what's happening in the marketplace. We are living through a data and information revolution. If you want to be a chief marketing officer, that's a full-time job. A CFO, full-time job. Uh, and that's who many of these people are. They're specialists, you know, the uh, CIO, the uh, data analytics person, et cetera. But the reality is that the C-suite is more out of touch with what their customer-facing colleagues do than ever before. Now, the other hand, however, Pat, uh, is this, um, and that is that it's not the figure in the book is not uh, that uh, sales um, training has increased 20%. The reality is that companies on average spend 20% per capita more on sales training than they do on any other function, right? The, the point being that companies already spend a ton of money on sales, but it's a little bit like public education. The issue is ultimately not how much are they spending, but how are they spending it? 
And that gets us back <clears throat> to the changes going on in the marketplace and the disconnect between um, the C-suite and uh, their sales uh, activities in many, many firms. See, see what I, well, I mean, you're, 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 well, you're the professor. I probably can't disagree with you here, but, but my friends who are recruiters saying the problems that they're seeing is in this work from home kind of world, a lot of companies are not, are not prepared to bring people on board in, in a, because they can't see them in the office. They're only looking for salespeople who've already worked in the industry. And there's not a lot of those because a lot of those people have signed non-competes. So they're not hiring salespeople. And it's just, it's just at the, at the same time, I have, have a lot of people who listen to the podcast who reach out to me trying to find jobs and they, and they can't, despite the fact that they've been selling, you know, B2B tech for years. Well, but I think there are two things going on there, Pat. Um, and uh, one is what I'll call the short-term issue. Uh, you know, quite obviously, when um, the economy goes through, again, the economic impact of the uh, pandemic, uh, you would expect hiring, not just in sales, you know, we don't need special pleading about this, uh, but hiring across the board uh, is not what it was. Uh, look at the data uh, about this. And, and, it, and that's not surprising. I guess that's not surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the second thing, however, is a longer term issue. And that is uh, what I said earlier about how these changes affect uh, hiring, training, etc. cetera. There, ha there are inherent challenges in hiring and sales that don't exist in many other business functions. For example, if you're looking to hire an engineer, you can go to a school and it's a little bit like walking into a buffet. What are you looking for? Chemical engineering, electrical engineering, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> if you want an accountant or a finance person, you can find people that majored in those subjects. The same is true for software computer programming. But of the something like 4,400 colleges and universities in the U.S., um, last time I looked, less than 200 even had a sales course, let alone a sales program. Yet, here's the other important fact, more than 50% of college graduates, no matter what their undergraduate major was, whether it was business administration or art history, the estimates are that more than 50% are gonna wind up working in sales at some point in their careers. Now, notice what the implications of those basic facts are. A, most salespeople start their careers knowing close to zero about how to sell, all right? Uh, so companies, whether they like it or not, uh, are forced to do the, um, the training, the development, et cetera, hence the 20% more uh, per capita. The second thing, I think, is the hiring processes in most companies. And um, again, you know, I'd, I'd urge your listeners to take a look at the book because, uh, you know, the, the, these are the facts. Uh, but the reality is that most managers and especially sales managers vastly, and I don't mean a little bit, I mean vastly overestimate their ability to judge somebody's fit for the job based on interviews. Uh, this, there's about 60 years of consistent research about this and the correlation between somebody's evaluation in the job interview and their actual performance on the job, depending on the, um, the company, varies usually between 0.2 and 0.4. In other words, less than the 50-50 odds of flipping a coin, all right? Uh, and there are ways you can get better at this, uh, many, many ways. But as with most big problems, there's both a supply issue and a demand issue. Most sales managers uh, basically trust their gut in an unstructured interview, and the data about the results are pretty definitive. Uh, and yet, if I can say so, when I show this data to executives, it's a little bit like the uh, Kubler-Ross stages of grief. You know, 
Uh, the first uh, stage is denial. I don't believe it. The second stage is, well, what they call exceptionalism. <laughs> I guess that, you know, I guess that's true of you, Pat, and it's true of you, Frank, but not me. I'm a horse whisperer. Somehow I can peer into people's souls in an interview. Uh, and then the third stage, I think, is for companies that are good at this, uh, is they begin to do some of the things I talk about in the book. They do multiple interviews. They understand that selling in particular is a performance art. It's about behavior. It's not about how sharp somebody looked at their interview. So they institute different policies and procedures that are, in effect, probationary periods or job trials. Lots of things that one can do about this. These are all things that I, in my consulting, that I teach. There's assessments you can put people through to make it get a good sense of what it's like for them to work for you, a good opportunity for them to get a sense of what it's like working for you, because it's a, it's a matchmaking in my mind. It's got yeah. to be a good deal on both ends. Yeah, I think that's an excellent metaphor. Uh, and I, I um, you know, the assessments, I think, are an interesting topic, though, uh, unto themselves, Pat. Um, because depending on what assessment one is using, uh, my experience is that in sales in particular, most of the assessments that are used, uh, you know, Myers-Briggs being a classic example, these assessments, A, were never developed for hiring purposes. They were developed for other purposes. So to some extent, you're putting the square peg in the round hole. B, there's, you know, you, there's a lot of um, a doubt about whether the assessments even actually assess what they're supposed to do. Again, I'll use Myers-Briggs, you know, people have pointed out for years that, you know, the same person taking a Myers-Briggs at two different times very often comes out differently. And then thirdly, in sales in particular, it's not just the assessment you use, but who's using it and how do they interpret it? And when is the last time you found a sales force that really trained its sales managers in how to use and interpret the assessments that they may be using? So uh, I'm for you. I think it minimizes bias. I think it's better than gut feel, but there's still a lot of issues surrounding uh, assessments. My assessments are different than those. My assessments are things like I send them an email and I say, you look interesting. I'd like to talk to you. Give me a call and see how fast they give me a call. Yeah. If they give me a call, if they send me an email that said, when's a good time? I'm like, I don't want them. Or I go, here's a piece of software. Give me a demo on it. You got to figure it out. Or here's an idea that we have, create a pitch deck for it and see what, see what kind of PowerPoints they come up with. Yeah. Well, I think what you're doing there, uh, you're doing the most important thing, Right. Uh, you're focusing on behaviors. Do they get back to me? Do they do X? As opposed to attitudes. Uh, yes. And in sales in particular, again, sales is about behavior. It's it's not about, you know, how good or bad somebody feels. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. To wrap this up, because there's an awful lot in this book here. <laughs> we could go down any one of these, Frank. <laughs> it... it and I, I could talk at great length on these because I think they're all really, really interesting. But if, but in regards from the listener's point of view, what kinds of things can people do to to work better with their sales managers or or what they should be expecting from their sales management? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, uh, as with uh, most things in business, uh, it always takes two uh, to tango. Uh, let's start at the top. Um you know, uh, it's not as though uh, a CIO uh, or a CMO or, or, or someone else in the C-suite, the CEO, their job is not to be a great sales leader, but their job is to understand in some detail what is their go-to-market customer acquisition model and know what the right questions are to ask of their sales leaders. Uh, and again, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there's an increasing gap there, and many of these senior executives uh, don't know the right questions to ask. Then on the other side, let me talk about sales leaders, because 
what we've been talking about, I think, has very, very significant implications, not just for companies, but for careers and sales. It's changing big time. Let me just give you an example. Um, because of the data revolution, sales in many more companies is now much more transparent than it was in the past. In many companies, the sales force was kind of this mysterious black box, Right. And if you were a sales leader, if you met your numbers every quarter, they basically, you know, let you alone. Uh, those, those days are changing fast. And I see that on the boards that I serve on. Now, one of the things that happens because of data is that the finance function and the CFO in particular now get a lot of granular data on an ongoing basis about sales. And two things happen. A, the first thing they do is they smack their head and say, holy mackerel, I had no idea on a fully burdened basis how much money we were spending in sales. And then the second thing is, you know, these finance people are annoying. They ask questions of the sales leader about resource allocation and about the financial results. And the reality, I think, is that many sales leaders lack the required level of financial literacy that is increasingly important going forward. Most sales leaders can tell you about the top line, but if you begin to talk about things like cost to serve or return on invested capital, in other words, things finance is interested in, they, they often don't even know what the terms mean. So I think the C-suite has a responsibility to understand what the relevant questions are and I think sales leaders uh, are, are in many ways forced to up their game precisely because there's more data available to those people at the top. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. Great salespeople are this way naturally. They think like business owners Yeah, because they own their, they own their quota, right? They're paid on commission. And they're talking to C, they're often selling to C-suite, so they got to learn their language uh, in terms of, you know, this product or service they have and what the return on investment is for that. Great salespeople think that way already. And and I think that is good advice for listeners who who aren't doing that right now. Yeah, the, I, I would agree with you about they do that, uh, that the great salespeople do that with the customers. But the issue is, do they do it with their own companies, Pat? And, you know, again, here's my quick example. Oh, if they're, yes, well... <laughs> You know, the, da the data I'm going to yes. cite about sales compensation has been remarkably consistent throughout my career, give or take a few percentage points. But if you look at sales incentives in most companies, you know, once you get beyond fixed salary, uh, the variable comp, in about 70% of uh, companies, that variable comp incentive is tied to sales volume, period. End of story not cost to serve, not return on capital, et cetera. Now, notice what the message is to sales in a system like that. There is no such thing as a bad customer, right? The message is basically go forth and multiply. And that's what salespeople do because they know how they're getting paid. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting asymmetry. I think you're exactly right about what a good salesperson knows about their customer's business the issue is whether they're business owners for their own business. Yes. <laughs> the good news, Patrick, the These good news is that we'll never, we'll never be out of work because there's lots of room to improve. Yes. Um, so let's, so Frank, if people want to connect with you, how would they do that? Where would they find you? Uh, well, a couple of ways. I mean, you know, go to Amazon. You'll um, you'll see the book there and goodreads.com. Title of the book, again, Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. Uh, it's published by Harvard Business Review Press. You can contact them directly for volume discounts and uh, customization. Um, you can contact me via email or LinkedIn, and I'll put you in touch with them. And I also hope, Pat, that uh, Sales Babble can post uh, some of that information with the podcast. We, 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 we absolutely will. Um, my last, my, I guess my last question is, 
when is um, Harvard rolling out their bachelor's degree in sales? Well, uh, I don't know about the bachelor's degree. I'm at the business school. We only do graduate students. Uh, I wouldn't hold my breath uh, about when uh, they're going to do that. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, let's get back to our last uh, topic. Um, we, we have sales courses uh, where I teach. I teach one. There, there are others as well. But I always tell my students uh, the, um, the same thing because they, they take the course and they, they come out, I think, surprised and pleased by, among other things, how uh, intellectually interesting sales can be. And, I, and then they come and talk to me, gee, where do I go to, to, to start a good sales career? And I basically tell them what you said earlier about uh, being a business owner. I said, listen, you, you should aspire in your career not to be the greatest sales leader in the world, but to run something and add value. And in some companies, sales is a great place to start. It's a great route to general management. And in others, it's what I call the velvet ghetto. You know, as long as you make your numbers, they leave you alone, but you're essentially invited out of the room when the senior executives talk about pricing and the rest of the business. So, you know, that, that's always my advice to young people. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much, Frank, for babbling here on Sales Babble. It's been a ton of fun. Pat, thank you very much. I, I do appreciate the opportunity. I think the big takeaway here is that the more that salespeople can do to think and act like a business owner, the more successful they're going to be. And conversely, the more managers can learn about salespeople and think and act like them, the better they can understand the one organization that pays for all the other organizations in the company. It's a win-win for a company to be business mindful. To connect with Frank, you can find him and his book, in the show notes at www.salesbabble.com. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, please like, share, and subscribe so you never miss another episode. If you got any questions or comments about this episode, while you're on the homepage, you can click the Babble Me button and that will send an email directly to me. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm out there all the time. That's all we've got for this week, folks. Until next week, take care and have a highly successful and a profitable selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble podcast. Find us at www.salesbabble.com. This is a production of Abenero Media.